Hi everyone. Today I want to thank you so much for joining the Fairfax Egg Bank team today as we discuss the benefits of frozen donor eggs, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. Today you'll be hearing from several, several members of our team, including Dr. Larry Udoff, Fairfax Egg Bank's medical director, Debbie Viafania, our donor egg program director, Terry Reeves, the director of client relations, and myself, an embryologist here at Fairfax. I want to begin by really talking about the patient's process and how they begin the donor egg journey, talk about the evolution of egg freezing, the benefits of frozen donor egg, and how those benefits have been amplified during coronavirus, then kind of segue into some of the precautions that Fairfax Egg Bank is taking for new donors in our program, and end with a recap of how to select and secure a donor at Fairfax, and then, of course, ample time for questions at the end. Let's, however, start with a quick poll. How familiar are you with the benefits of frozen donor eggs? Looks like we have uh, quite a mixed bag of people, um, their, their knowledge of frozen donor eggs. We have 27% that are not very familiar, 50% that are somewhat familiar, and 23% that are very familiar. We'll hopefully get a lot of you in the expert category by the end of this presentation. Great, thank you, Debbie. So Dr. Udoff, uh, when you have a patient that's coming in that's beginning the donor egg journey, what counseling or advice does every patient get? And are there questions that you've heard time and time again from every patient? Yes, thank you, Amanjo. A significant part of the initial consultation for a patient or couple considering uh, donor egg IVF, we talk about donor screening, uh, selection, and testing. Uh, so egg donors or egg donor candidates take months of, of testing and evaluation before we can determine they'd be appropriate uh, to be an actual egg donor. And so various categories of testing include uh, FDA eligibility testing, and this would be for any uh, anonymous or non-directed donor. And so this involves very specific testing uh, labs that the FDA has certified, a physical exam uh, per FDA protocol, a, a medical history questionnaire, and these things are repeated and you, you have to uh, particularly update the lab testing just before the egg retrieval. So we could only use a, a donor that has passed the FDA screening, but there's so many other important things that donors need to be screened and tested for. And so of, of course we're, we're using donor egg because we're trying to get better quality eggs. So age is the single best predictor of, of egg quality and I would recommend that all donors be 32 years uh, old or, or younger. And then additionally, we do hormone tests to check egg quality. So this includes the AMH hormone level, the FSH level, the antral follicle count, ultrasound to look at the number of, of uh, small follicles or immature eggs early in the menstrual cycle. Uh, and other things too are, are uh, equally as important. And so donors have to go through uh, psychological counseling and screening, not only to uh, uh, evaluate for any underlying mental illness, but so they're aware of what they're getting into, that this is a, a good idea for the donor and something that they would look back favorably uh, years down the road. Um, and of uh, course, genetic testing. And so one of the initial steps of donor screening is going back many generations into the donor's family history to make sure there isn't a pattern of uh, certain diseases that could potentially be passed on to offspring. And then even more so, and we'll get into more of the specifics later in the presentation, but even more so, uh, the, the donors will have an extended panel genetic screen uh, to see what uh, diseases they may carry, and so that this information can be available uh, to the uh, recipient to make sure they're making an appropriate uh, selection. And then we talk a lot about the option of frozen and fresh eggs. And they both have their relative pros and cons, and we're certainly going to talk more about that today, too. Uh, but that's a big part of the discussion, um, and uh, this gets into donor availability issues. And then after all of that, it's really up to the patient. You know, now then we focus on what's important for them. You know, what, what about the donor profile uh, are they looking for in, in terms of uh, ethnicity, uh, education, um, hobbies, interests? You know, all kinds of different things. Thank you, Dr. Udolf. Um, we have 200 plus donors on the website. Debbie, can you talk us through a little bit of how patients can search the database to find the donor that works best for them? Sure. As uh, Dr. Udolf mentioned, we have quite a um, vast 
um, screening panel that we, all of our donors go through. It's very rigorous. Um, less than 0.1% of the donors that apply to our program actually make it through. So we have a very um, diverse group of donors and a lot to search for when you're looking for donors. The best place to start is on our donor database, which you can find easily on our website. If you're browsing through the website anywhere, um, you can click on uh, fairfaxeggbank.com um, and you can look at our donor profiles from anywhere on our site. Um, you'll be able to use tools to filter down, but we do recommend that you look at a broader range of donors when you're first starting to look for donors, um, not without um, maybe eliminate some of the filters. And then as you want to fine tune your um, search, you can start using some of the, the feature tools and some of the filters. Um, we do have an extensive donor selection of diverse donors available on the website, um, all of which currently have cohorts available. So if you see a donor that you like on our website, you can guarantee that we do have eggs in store, um, in stock uh, on those donors um, currently. All of our donors have been pre-screened and are FDA eligible. So those are things that you shouldn't have to worry about when looking for a donor. Sometimes when you're in the fresh, um, selecting fresh donors, you still have to make sure that those donors are FDA approved and meet the criteria to be a donor. But all of our donors are, are pre-screened and FDA eligible if you see them on our website. We do offer both childhood and adult photos of our donors. Um, you must register as a recipient. You need to register on our website. It's a very easy process. There's no fee to register just so you can sign the anonymity consent and see um, and have access to the, the donor's adult photos that they've agreed to share with potential recipients. Um, and then once you have done all that, we do uh, recommend starting to use our filter process so that you can narrow your search and find the specific traits that are important to you. Um, it's a very easy process to go through. You can search things such as hair color, race, eye color, height, education, just to name a couple of things. Terry's going to walk us through um, how to select your donor and how to procure um, the donor of your choice. Great. Thank you, Debbie, for reviewing those features. Um, and Terry uh, will recap how that process works to secure and then select and then secure a donor. I do, however, uh, want to discuss the frozen part of frozen donor egg. I would argue in the last decade that the advent and the widespread use of vitrification is the number one thing that revolutionized the IVF field. So prior to vitrification, the methods that we're using for freezing uh, were not delicate enough for eggs. And so eggs would form these intracellular um, crystals and then not survive when thawed. I, I distinctly remember when I started, uh, we had a very young patient, uh, teenage, um, who had a Hodgkin's lymphoma diagnosis, who wanted to do fertility preservation. And then with the previous freezing methods, um, where eggs would not survive the thaw, she was advised to pick a sperm donor to fertilize her eggs so that the embryos could be frozen um, because they were more resilient. So Dr. Udoff, can you talk a little bit about how vitrification has changed how you counsel your patients and ultimately how you practice? Sure, and I completely agree, Alman Joe, that uh, vitrification process for eggs and for embryos as well has really revolutionized uh, some of the things we do in IVF. You know, I've, I've been doing this for a while, a few decades now, and, and I remember when this was a dream almost, that, that one day we might be able to successfully freeze eggs and warm them and be able to produce pregnancies. And so it's, it's been, as I say, a game changer, particularly uh, for our, our female cancer patients. For the male cancer patients, freezing sperm was easy. Uh, you, you lose a lot of sperm in the process, but you're starting with tens of millions of them. So if you lose half, you're, you're still good. But eggs, obviously, much smaller numbers, and it wouldn't work that way. And so for our female cancer patients, we now have the option of having them freeze their eggs before they go through uh, what we term gonadotoxic chemotherapy, chemotherapy that, that would uh, essentially uh, render the patient in, in the menopause after they uh, complete their treatment. And so they can essentially be their own egg donor. And now so-called social freezing or fertility preservation has become very common just for patients that uh, realize they're gonna delay childbearing and they're concerned about age-related decreased ovarian reserve, the, the concept that it becomes harder to conceive as you uh, become older. And so they can essentially be their own egg donors. Um, and obviously now for our patients that uh, are at, at the point where they need an egg donor themselves to, uh, to attempt conception, you know, the, the old way we used to do this, which was over 10 years ago, uh, was successful, but very cumbersome. You know, the, it, it was quite a process that uh, we had to coordinate the cycles uh, real time of a donor and of a recipient. 
Uh, so first off, the, the recipient had to wait till the donor was available. That wasn't always convenient. Uh, it meant a lot of hormonal manipulation between the parties involved to try to get them in sync. And then there was a fair amount of drama because this was all real time. We didn't know how many eggs we were going to get till we got them. You know, we didn't know, we'd mentioned FDA eligibility. There were a few times where, uh, unfortunately, at the moment of egg retrieval, when we had to update the FDA criteria, we found they're no longer eligible. So months and months had gone into this, and here we are at this moment, and we can't even use the eggs. Uh, so, you know, that, that we, we knew that when we were able to uh, perfect the technique uh, so that we could safely freeze eggs and get good success rates with them, uh, that, that all this would be history. We wouldn't have to deal with, with this anymore. And so this is really the advantage of the, the, uh, the egg bank. Another big, big thing, and I, I think it gets overlooked sometimes, a, a big discussion in our field has to do with access to care. That unfortunately, across this country, there are many people that need infertility treatment and they don't have access to it. And it's typically a financial reason. Insurance often doesn't cover infertility treatment. And if someone doesn't have the resources, then they're, they're just simply out of luck. Donor egg was always one of those things, you know, in my practice that uh, I would observe that patients would go through IVF and those that weren't successful and we reached the point in time where they needed an egg donor, that would kind of be the, the break point where, where many couples just didn't have the resources to continue. And th that was the end of their journey. But with the egg bank, with the efficiencies that come with egg banking, the cost is a fraction of, of what the typical fresh cycle used to be years ago. And so now this is a uh, donor egg is much more accessible to so many more people. And I think for, for me in my practice, that's been the biggest thing. You know, many of the patients now that I have come through and, and are using the egg bank and are successful with the egg bank some 10 years ago or so, it wouldn't have been possible. We didn't have an option for them. So this has really been one of the more dramatic improvements in the world of IVF over the last 40 years. I appreciate that, Dr. Yud Dr. Udall. And I think um, you're absolutely correct. The data for vitrified oocytes speaks for itself. So the data here is uh, not cherry picked. It is averaged from across all of the data received from all of Fairfax Egg Bank's 300 and plus affiliate clinic sites. So for the year of 2019, we had a 93% egg survival rate after thaw. 69% of cases had two or more good quality embryos. And there was a 55% clinical pregnancy rate. So Dr. Yudoff, when you have patients that are anxious or concerned, what, what is the cause of that concern? What do you find they're most anxious about? Yeah, there, there are many things that, that they're worried about. But, you know, what, once we discuss donor egg and, and then we get excited about the prospects there, of course, the reality sets in about the costs. And as we were saying a moment ago, you know, this is where many times patients realize this is just not going to be possible for them. Um, and and the, the egg bank has allowed this much lower cost option. And with the flat fee that's associated with the egg bank, they know what it is. There's not going to be surprises afterwards. And I think that's a, a big, big difference. Uh, and, and avoiding the, the drama, as we were talking about, that these are donors who have already gone through and had their eggs retrieved. The eggs are ready for use. So we don't have to worry about did the donor take their medications on time or you know, are we going to get eggs or are they going to be FDA uh, uh, eligible? That's already done. All of that is, is, is no longer a worry. And then what, once we, we've settled on the egg bank, then, you know, uh, as human nature is, you try to think of what's the next thing to worry about. Well, I got to ship the eggs from, from point A to point B. Well, luckily, uh, here at Fairfax Egg Bank, we have the, the team with expertise in that. You know, before the Fairfax Egg Bank, there is the Fairfax Cryobank. So we've had for quite a long time here, people that are expert in shipping sperm and now eggs. And also for years, we've been doing embryos all around the world. And, and so that, that's what it takes, you know, a knowledgeable team that knows how to get this done. So it's done safely so that the eggs are there at the clinic on time and everything goes smoothly. And so I, I think, uh, you know, with the resources we have here, we can allay a lot of the fears that, that our patients may have. Absolutely. And I think all of that is built upon a foundation of expertise, like you mentioned. So we have embryologists that have decades of experience in warming, freezing, storing, and shipping reproductive tissue. You have a donor coordinator team that is incredibly thorough 
and that holds each of our donors to the highest standards. Um, and then, of course, our best-in-class client relations team who is committed to your patient and is committed to the clinics that they work with. And they want to make it as seamless as possible. So, Dr. Yudoff, you touched about this a little bit earlier, but the role that genetic testing plays in frozen donor egg. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, this is another big advancement. You know, it's all about technology now coming in and changing medicine. So some people have said that we, we've entered the genetic age of medicine. And, and what, what's implied there is that in, in all different areas of, of medical practice now, we are able to get more and more information about how genetics will impact things. So for example, you know, this idea of personalized medicine, so picking out an antibiotic, picking out a blood pressure medication, it now can be uh, done personalized to someone's genetic profile. In our world, we're, we're looking at reproductive risk, and we're looking at knowing what's the risk of a couple having a child uh, with a particular genetic disease. And so the old way, and the old way was just a few years ago, but the old way uh, was uh, taking an extensive family history, seeing if there were any risks that you could determine from that, and then ethnicity-based. And then there were a couple very common recessive genetic disorders that we would always screen for because they were very common. So this included things like cystic fibrosis or spinal muscular atrophy, SMA. And so these recessive disorders are where you have the situation where there's two copies of a gene. And if you're a carrier, you have one abnormal copy and one normal copy, so you're healthy and fine. But the scenario where you have the two abnormal copies, that's where the problem lies. That's when the disease state will occur. And so what we now recommend to our patients is that they get this information preconception. And so in the, in the world of donor egg or donor sperm, uh, what we do is that we would recommend that our, our patient, in this case, the sperm source, be it the partner or sperm donor, that that genetic testing panel is done. And these are extended panels. Now we are able to check over 280 different genetic diseases. So we do the extended panel screen. We see what we come up with. And then we can match that with an appropriate donor where there's not a disease overlap. And so now they know moving forward that it, there's never a zero risk, but their risk is much, much lower uh, than had they not had this information. So this is a, a big advancement. And you know, I think we're in, in time, we're really gonna see a reduction. Individually, th these genetic diseases are quite rare, but there's hundreds and hundreds of them. And so my hope is that, you know, in the coming years, we're going to see a dramatic reduction in uh, children born with these congenital uh, birth defects that, that are related to these single gene disorders that we can now screen for. And so then on the Fairfax Egg Bank website, if you see a helix icon, that indicates a donor that has undergone the expanded genetic testing panel. And then of those donors, the donors that have a C at the end of their donor number, um, those are tested to be a healthy carrier of one or more conditions. And of course, your client relations team can provide more information about those donors. And so Dr. Yudoff, I know you and I have talked offline about this a little bit, but privacy and anonymity have become something that patients ask about a lot. So with 23andMe and Ancestry.com, there's a greater uh, risk of identity information being discovered. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the concerns your patients have and then what the egg bank does on the donor side to protect donor um, privacy while providing options for their patients? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, so as we were saying, that this is the genetic age. So all of our genetic information is out there. These big databases with um, 23andMe and Ancestry.com, we're, we're freely giving what is what couldn't be any more private information than our DNA, but it's done and it's out there. And so years ago, when we talked about anonymity, so we were talking about for most of our patients choosing an anonymous donor, what we meant then and still imply now is that we are, are not going to share information between uh, the, the recipient and the donor. We're not going to share uh, their name, address, phone number, anything that would allow them to, to connect. Uh, I can remember the old days where we used to have a, a back entrance and the donors would come through the back entrance. So they, they wouldn't run into the patient in the front waiting room. Um, but we, we did our best to try to make sure that donors and recipients did, did meet. But we realized things are changing. There's, there, there are many things that are changing. So one, as you mentioned, the genetic uh, information that's already out there. So it, it certainly could be possible that a uh, an offspring from donor egg 
could search out through these genetic databases uh, to find a, a relative of the donor or even the donor themselves. And, and we, we, we make this a big part of our counseling for recipients and for donors. You know, as donors are going through the screening process to see if they're appropriate to donate, this is part of their psychological counseling. They realize they need to realize that this is possible. And same for my patients, that they go through a, a counseling process as well. And they talk about the disclosure issue most of the research about disclosure says that disclosure is the healthier option, that families are, are, are better adjusted, if you will, if at some point it is disclosed that they were donor conceived. Though this is clearly going to be up to the couple, you know, no one's going to force this issue upon them, um, but they, they were, our patients will, will get counseling from the people that we work with that, that will tell them uh, based on this data that, you know, that, that would be the pre recommendation, the preferred way to go. Um, so we do have this option with uh, the Fairfax Egg Bank that we call the ID option. So the ID option is uh, an, an option, meaning that you, you, the recipient uh, does not have to pursue this, but they can, in which when the offspring has reached age 18, they're an adult, they can contact the Fairfax Egg Bank and we will provide information to help them connect with the donor. And obviously the donor has been likewise screened and, and counseled that this could happen. Um, so this is just to provide that connection. You know, as, as a default, the recipient will always have all the information that they use to select the donor uh, in the first place. So they can share, you know, all the physical characteristic information, even the photos that, that they had at that time. Um, and, and maybe that'll be enough for some, uh, but for others, uh, they may want to actually have that conversation, that connection and we can help facilitate that because as we're learning over time, you know, that, that the donor conceived uh, children, many of them want this. You know, decades ago, we made the assumption that this should be one of those things we keep secret and, and, and separate. And, and I think we're learning that for some, maybe that isn't the best. And we're trying to provide this option to our recipients um, so that we can help make this happen. I appreciate that, Dr. Udall. So we've covered a lot so far. I do want to talk um, a little bit about some of the concerns that people have had with moving forward um, with donor egg in particular during COVID. So during the coronavirus pandemic, you may have seen that your clinic's safety protocols um, and other things have changed. So your clinic has its own requirements for patient safety. And of course, uh, Fairfax ensures safety for our donors and our staff here. So what we are finding is that the benefits of donor egg is amplified during coronavirus. So the unpredictability um, that is found throughout donor egg treatment is only being compounded during the pandemic. So in the best of times, coordinating with a donor was challenging. Frozen donor egg means it's available on your schedule and on your timeline while providing you a diverse portfolio of options to choose from. Um, in addition, you have a guaranteed number of eggs, so it reduces a lot of that um, uncertainty that comes with a fresh donor option. And then ultimately, uh, you have an embryo development guarantee, which provides a lot of reassurance. And um, we have seen occasionally instances where a retrieval does not pan out, like Dr. Yudoff mentioned, where the donor is not FDA eligible or no uh, viable eggs are retrieved, they're all immature. Um, and ultimately, the patient ends up being on the hook uh, financially. And so with frozen donor egg, um, the reliability and the flexibility we're finding is incredibly important for patients' peace of mind. And I will let Debbie kind of talk about some of the things that Fairfax is doing um, on the donor end to ensure safety. Great. Thanks, Donna Joe. So as you can imagine, um, you know, things are obviously different currently with COVID-19. Um, and so one of the things that we just like to, to stress is that although there's no scientific evidence of um, transmission of SARS-CoV-2 um, through oocytes, we do here at Fairfax Egg Bank um, want to take a proactive approach to mitigate the risk um, and anticipate any possible new regulations or requirements to protect our inventory. Uh, so for each cycle, uh, every one of our donors are tested both um, through screening, they're screened with a questionnaire and they're actually tested with the RNA um, nasal swab 
to make sure that they're not um, currently infected with, with COVID, nor have they been exposed um, in the last 28 days. So we do ask them twice throughout the cycle. We ask them again once at the beginning of their cycle before they start their medications, and we do the RNA test. And then again, just before they have their retrieval, we will uh, make sure that they're safe to proceed with their retrieval and ask them then and do the test again at that time. Um, if we do find a donor it does test positive or it answers yes or in a positive way to any of the questionnaires, um, then we will defer the donor and will not proceed with the retrieval. So the last thing that we want you to worry about is COVID in this time of COVID. So when you're purchasing eggs from Fairfax Egg Bank, you, um, you know, if a donor has come through and cycled during that time, you can be assured that she has been screened, she has been tested, and we found her not to be um, positive or at risk of transmitting or uh, of, of having COVID-19. Um, a couple of other things, you know, um, at the beginning of a cycle, again, you know, we, we do the testing and we do, there's many clinics that will even do it on recipients that, um, you know, helps to make sure that you're not uh, uh, positive at that time as well. Um, so that's, again, the last thing we want you to worry about when having to select your donor. So uh, now I have Terry to present to you um, how to select your donor and how to move forward in securing a donor. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Debbie, and welcome, everyone. I'm super excited about this webinar and the information that we are able to share with you today. So when you're ready to proceed, we are ready to help. And I'd like to review the process of securing a donor with Fairfax Egg Bank. The process at a high level can be summarized in four steps. Consult with your IVF clinic, reserve the cohort or cohorts that you wish to purchase, complete necessary documentation and finalize the purchase. So we're gonna go through each of the steps in greater detail. So the first step is to consult with your IVF clinic. It's very important that we know that you are able to proceed with frozen donor egg and your healthcare provider may request additional testing to confirm that you are in fact a suitable candidate. And our team will confirm that you have been cleared by your clinic to purchase frozen donor egg. Once you've been cleared to purchase frozen donor egg, you can visit our website, as Debbie introduced you to, um, to view um, not only the donors, but also to confirm that your clinic is an affiliated partner with Fairfax Egg Bank. Currently, Fairfax Egg Bank is affiliated with more than 300 IVF clinics in 45 United States, Canada, Mexico, Brazil, and Australia, so it is very likely that we're already affiliated with your clinic. However, if your clinic is not affiliated with us, please don't worry. You can still continue to purchase your frozen donor eggs and we'll work on the back end to get your clinic affiliated. The next step in the process may be the most personal and sometimes the most challenging part and that's selecting your ideal donor. And as mentioned by Debbie, um, Fairfax Egg Bank has one of the largest repositories of highly selective, fully screened, FDA compliant donors. And we recognize that finding your ideal donor is a very personal process and we're here to help you through that. Again, to begin your search, you want to visit our website, which is fairfaxeggbank.com. And if you're not registered on our website, you will be able to see the childhood photos and a limited view of each donor's profile. But in order to review the full profile of our donors, you will have to register on our website. Debbie mentioned it is free and our access is unlimited. And upon registration, you will have access to childhood and adult photos, along with the donor's family medical history across three generations, her genetic testing summary, and some of our donors even have audio interviews and personal essays. As mentioned, donors with active profiles on our website have at least one cohort available, and we sell eggs in cohorts. And a cohort is a minimum of six to eight mature eggs. And you can favorite donors, write notes about the donors, um, and filter your search as specific as you would like uh, on the characteristics that are important to you. The donor search process can be overwhelming, so please know that a member of our client relations team will contact you upon your registration to assist you every step of the way. You can send your favorite donors to the client relations team and they'll be able to provide more information about how many frozen donor eggs are available for purchase. I want to point out that donor availability is on a first come first serve basis 
and cohorts can only be reserved or held by a member of the client relations team. You can, however, hold as many cohorts as you wish to purchase for up to two complimentary business days while you confirm whether or not you would like to move forward. The next step of the process is completing some important documents. Once you have a cohort on hold, the client relations specialist will be sending over important legal documents for you to review and for your signature. These docu documents must be signed and returned in their entirety within that two business day hold period. And if you've selected a donor that's been found to be a healthy carrier of a known genetic condition, there will be additional paperwork and additional steps to ensure that the donor and your sperm source are a genetic suitable match. But these additional steps will not slow down your process. Upon return of these initial documents, the client relations specialist will initiate what we call our donor match confirmation to your clinic to ensure that you, your clinic, and Fairfax Ag Bank are all on the same page about the donor that you wish to move forward with. Finally, based on your clinic's affiliation status, you'll remit final payment to either your clinic or directly to Fairfax Ag Bank. Now, while it seems like that's a lot of steps in our process, it really is relatively quick. From the time that you put a cohort on hold to the time we're ready to remit payment is just seven calendar days. And now we're ready to finalize your process. Once your donor is secure, the last details will either be to coordinate shipping with your clinic or keep the cohort in storage until you're ready. We coordinate shipping with your clinic to ensure that they're ready to receive the eggs and that they can accept them. Fairfax Egg Bank offers complimentary storage for up to 90 days, and if you need to store them longer, that's fine, and the storage fee then is. So, in summary, our commitment to donor quality and service excellence makes us a premier and cost-effective solution for frozen donor egg recipients. The benefits of frozen donor egg have been established and are amplified during this COVID-19 pandemic. When you're ready to begin your journey, Fairfax Egg Bank is ready for you. You'll have added peace of mind with our complimentary storage and our embryo development guarantee. The Fairfax Egg Bank experience and industry leading techniques are second to none in the field of egg banking. And our client relations team is here to support you every step of the way. Together, we will build your family. All right, well, a great deal of information has been shared today. And I feel like I've even learned a little bit of something new. So let's go ahead and take another poll. Do you feel more informed about the benefits of frozen donor egg now? Answers are coming in. Wow, great. Uh, looks like everybody got some great information from this seminar, um, this webinar. I appreciate it. Um, looks like, yes, great information, 78%, and somewhat need more information, 22%. Um, more than happy to make this, uh, actually, this uh, information webinar will be available again. So um, if you miss something, like to go back and, and listen to it again, it will be available um, coming soon. So that's great. Thank you, Debbie. Um, and now we have time for questions. 